We have been requested to give a summary description of how the New York Temple in Brooklyn is being sold, and there's a big controversy now going on in the ISKCON Society, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, about how this building is being sold, why it's being sold, how did it come to a controversial sale. And we would say this is part of a pattern of many other properties in ISKCON which have been disposed of in, let's say, dubious ways <laughs> that have not been up to the satisfaction of the congregation of ISKCON. So we have to understand, first of all, how the assets and the properties of ISKCON got out of the control of the congregation members and out of the control of even the governing body. How did this happen? So first of all, we should understand that in 1977, when the founder of ISKCON departed, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Prabhupada, there was an asset grab by the top leaders of the society. They tried to usurp the assets into their control. And the way they did that was they declared that they were the appointed guru successors to Prabhupada, the unquestioned guru successors. Now, Prabhupada had 5,000 disciples of his own in ISKCON at the time, so the first thing that had to be done was to get rid of those 5,000 disciples because those people would be monitoring and overseeing and having concern for the property of ISKCON. So if you get rid of those people, the oversight group, the congregation, then you have free reign or more free reign over the property and how you will use or, or abuse those properties. So the 11 gurus, they gradually, gradually purged out most of the original disciples of Prabhupada. And what they did was they recruited new people to be their disciples. So this kind of, kind of siphoned off the original Prabhupada disciples and added disciples of the so-called appointed gurus. Now, these disciples were then put onto the corporate documents of ISKCON. So they were the signing people in charge of the properties. So the 11 gurus, the so-called living gurus, took control of the property by removing the Prabhupada disciples as signers on the properties, or on many of the properties, let's say, and they put their own people as the signers. So in this way, they they became the legal controllers of these properties. So this was a, uh, a move to take over the assets of ISKCON, the property assets. But they took over all the other assets. They were in charge of the bank accounts and the money and the funds and everything that was coming into ISKCON, the finances of ISKCON. And then they began to famously misuse the finances of ISKCON and live very opulent lives for the most part. Most of the 11 so-called gurus were living like Saudi princes <laughs> in very opulent situations, and the citizens were not living so opulently. Now, when it comes to the Gurukula children, Prabhupada had established schools for the children. The loss of assets to the schools was very dramatic, and so a number of the school children were complaining that they didn't get sufficient food and medicine and even blankets and soap and so on and so forth, while these 11 princes <laughs> were living like kings. Now, some of the former uh, Guru Kula students told me that this was very much like North Korea, where in North Korea, the big leaders live very opulently. They have giant feasts for themselves and big, uh, expensive living facilities and big cars and and the peons have to eat grass or eat dirt or eat an old cockroach, whatever they can find. 
<laughs> so, so this eventually turned into a lawsuit where the children sued the leaders of ISKCON, being deprived of, you know, just just the fundamental things they needed to live, and also many of them were abused and so on and so forth. So this is what happened. The assets were being all put into one area to take care of the opulent lifestyles of these so-called living gurus, and, and the assets were being drained off of other areas of the society, um, and still are. So when it comes to the Brooklyn Temple, as a result of the lawsuit, $400 million lawsuit, which was leveled against ISKCON, some of the properties of ISKCON were allegedly or apparently hidden away as being listed as ISKCON assets as a means of avoiding paying the victims of the child molesting lawsuit. So apparently what happened is that uh, ISKCON signed over the Brooklyn Temple to Ramabhadra and Ramapad in order to hide the asset of ISKCON. And so that became the Bharatiya Society, whatever that is. <laughs> and so the Bharatiya Society became the owner of the property, or supposedly... Uh, it's very hard to say. I mean, they wear many hats, these guys. Uh, they promote themselves as being ISKCON. They promote themselves as being the Bharatiya Society. They promote themselves as being the Hare Krishna movement. There are other legal entities that are going on from that address, from the Brooklyn Temple address. And uh, that needs to be investigated. But we would say that many of the directors of one charity are the also directors of another charity, or Ramapad has put his disciples or followers or whatever, or his loyal people as signers on these different legal charities. But uh, to give you some examples of how assets were siphoned away, for example, Bhagavan, who was the guru of Paris, he was living in a five-star hotel near the Paris temple, and when I, when I went to the temple, the shower was all full of dirty water, and I said, how does Bhagavan take a shower here? And they said, oh, he, he never even comes here to live. He lives in the hotel down the road. He just comes for an hour to give the class every day. <laughs> so, so Bhagavan's not even living in the facility. Uh, the people living in the facility are having all kinds of problems with crummy conditions or actually unlivable conditions, practically speaking. And he's not bothered by that because he's living like a Saudi prince down the road in a five-star hotel. So that means the money which is coming in to support the temple and finance the temple and fund repairs on the temple and stuff like that is being siphoned off. And it's going into Bhagavan's pocket and he's using that to support his own opulent life. Now one of the ladies living on Bhagavan's farm complained that she couldn't get sufficient supplies for her baby and even for herself. She said she couldn't get sanitary napkins, she couldn't get diapers, things like that. So she left Bhagavan's farm, went back to England. A couple of men came up from Bhagavan's farm, the husband, the father of the baby, and one other guy, and they forcibly kidnapped the baby and took it back to France. And then I got involved in this whole thing because it was in all the newspapers. The kidnapped baby, and I was deputed to go down and get the baby and bring it back to the mother, which I did. But this was in all of the newspapers all over Europe at the time that a woman on Bhagavan's farm could not get supplies that she needed for her baby. <laughs> so this was well known and, uh, to all of the other governing body leaders of ISKCON and so on and so forth, they all knew that Bhagavan was shortchanging the citizens and not taking care of them. A lot of times people say, well, this was not known, nobody knew it. Well, everybody else knew. It was in the newspapers. <laughs> everybody else knew that Bhagavan was not treating his citizens well. He wasn't providing for the citizens. And he was living opulently himself. So, this is a prime example. 
people are not getting the supplies they need. Bhagavan's living like the king. He's being driven around in a big BMW. But he also kicked out a whole bunch of people, Prabhupada devotees, and left them abandoned at the train station in Paris. And I had to go down and give money to these people and give them tickets. Uh, the guru of England, Jayatirtha, took those people in. And again, if that hadn't happened, if Jayatirtha by some chance had not taken those people in, that would have also been another huge newspaper story. All these people are being abandoned with their babies and everything else at the train station. But everybody in ISKCON knew this story. You know, or just about everybody, or hey, uh, for, for sure the leaders knew about this story. So again, they know that Bhagavan is mistreating the citizens. And Hari Kesh kicked out a bunch of people, and South Rup kicked out a bunch of people, and Jai Pataka kicked out a bunch of people, and Hridayananda kicked out a bunch of people, and Ramashar kicked out a bunch of people, and so on and so forth. So it was obviously some kind of a conspiracy to kick out all of these people, to remove these Prabhupada devotees, put the assets in the name of these 11 people, and then these 11 people could live like kings. And everyone else had to leave or just, again, eat grass uh, and eat an old cockroach, <laughs> like the citizens of North Korea. So this was going on, and you know everyone knew that the other leaders must be aware of this, because these stories were uh, being discussed by basically most of the citizens, or many of the citizens at the time. So it seems to me that there was some kind of a meeting before all this happened where they all agreed, we're just going to kick all these Prabhupada devotees out. And we're going to just make our own disciples and we're going to grab the buildings and assets and we're also going to live like kings. So that was going on. And Jayatirtha rented uh, his own private house in England, the Guru's house, and he got a big car, nice car for himself. And uh, Bhavananda was flying around the world buying jewelry, very expensive jewelry, and he would even lecture about that. He would talk in his lectures and say, oh, I went to buy a pen, but I could only find a pen that had a diamond on the top and a diamond on the bottom and a ruby in the middle. I wanted a diamond on the top and the bottom and the middle and a ruby on either end. Or <laughs> you know. So he would uh, complain that he couldn't find the pen that he was looking for that had enough uh, jewelry on it and the type of jewelry he wanted. So he's going around buying diamond studded pens for, for himself to write with. And he's even uh, openly talking about that. So again, everybody knew that because he was lecturing like that. He's actually lecturing, yeah, I'm, I'm buying this, buying that. And of course he was wearing uh, jewelry, expensive jewelry. So Meanwhile, what's happening with the Gurukula children? The children aren't getting uh, food. They aren't getting medicine. They aren't getting clothes. They aren't getting, they're not hiring uh, qualified teachers to take care of these children. And so this was brought to their attention by myself and others. Even like in 1980, I said, you can't mistreat the children like this, and you can't have the children worshiping these falling down people, and uh, this is not what Prabhupada wanted. And he didn't want all the assets of the society to be going to support the opulent lifestyles of a few people. And so I, I just got booted out of the society and told if there was a problem, I should just start a lawsuit and sue them or go to the police or whatever, if I thought a crime was going on. Well, eventually we did that. <laughs> we, we got uh, them sued for $400 million. We helped the police. We helped the police raid various of their properties. We helped the uh, federal marshals and the FBI and the police, you know, subdue a lot of the criminal activity that was going on in this society. Uh, and of course then I was branded as a bad guy because I says, well, why are you going to the court? Why are you going to the police? Why are you going to the FBI? Well, you told me to. You said <laughs> if there was a crime, I should take it to the authorities. And so I did. But anyway, that, in a nutshell, is what happened. The assets of the society were siphoned off by these people. 
uh, the properties gradually, gradually were put in their names, and then the property started disappearing. The Three Rivers Farm, which was Ramachar's farm, was sold. Hans Aduda's farm in Hopland, California, was sold. The Lake Huntington Farm uh, disappeared. I'm not sure if that was a purchased property or a rented property, but it just it, it, it went away. The Oklahoma farm went away. The 55th Street skyscraper building, which Prabhupada said, don't ever sell this under any circumstances, that was sold. The Krim Court building, which was a big mansion that Jaitirtha purchased, was sold. And uh, the Australia uh, zone had all kinds of problems with Bhavananda. As, as it turns out, he was gay and he was you know, having gay things going on there, and a bunch of people left his zone, which devastated the finances of that zone. I think the Austria zone went bankrupt, and they still owe a big fine. In order to open ISKCON in Austria, you would have to pay some big fine. So it basically went bankrupt. The France zone went bankrupt. They were trying to raise funds for that. And uh, when Jaitirtha eventually left, uh, same thing happened. There was a big financial crisis because his zone was going bankrupt. So, uh, again, these guys, they would just leave, walk off, and take money. They, they never had a problem with their own lives after they left ISKCON because, you know, they obviously siphoned off assets into their own private domain where they had control over it. So this was basically an economic war against ISKCON by these leaders. They economically attacked the society and many of the people in the society, including the children, suffered horribly as a result. They just did not manage the society in such a way that the citizens were being cared for and taken care of. And in many cases these Buildings were disposed of in different ways, and other properties are just run down. They're still existing, but they're not in very tip-top condition, like New Vrindavan. The buildings are run down. A lot of people have left the properties, and uh, Gita Nagri is run down. It's a farm in Pennsylvania. In Texas, the ISKCON Society seems to have ceased to exist, and they, we now have the Texas Krishnas, whatever that is. There's also a society in India called the GBC of West Bengal, which is, again, not really an ISKCON uh, name. And uh, Radhanath supposedly has a big society there, which is also not in the name of ISKCON. So there's been a lot of spin-off charities which have taken control of what is allegedly or supposedly is ISKCON. Like if you look at the uh, ISKCON publications, they say these are our ISKCON centers, but if you go to the center and you look up the property, you'll find out it's not in the name of ISKCON, and so on and so forth. So a lot of this was done to avoid, uh, apparently avoid legal, I mean to say, obligations towards ISKCON. So if ISKCON was sued, the new charity or different charity would not be obligated to participate in the ISKCON lawsuit. So that is apparently what happened in Brooklyn. Now, someone told me that this is called hiding of assets. <laughs> when you're sued, you transfer your assets into other accounts or you sell your house to your sister for a dollar you know, so you don't have any assets and they can't come after your assets and the deal is that maybe later on you'll get the property back from your sister <laughs> something like that and in the case of Brooklyn they didn't cooperate with the leaders of ISKCON when ISKCON came back and said okay we've hidden our asset here the Brooklyn building uh, we want our asset back we're going to use our asset apparently Romapod and uh, Ramabhadra and his little crew there decided why should we work with ISKCON? We have this building now, it's ours, and we should keep it. So that apparently is what's happening there. But 
we've also lost other other properties, uh, Lake Huntington, Seattle Temple, San Francisco Temple. A number of temples were rented properties or properties that were in the process of being purchased and they, they're now lost. And uh, in Russia, supposedly the government of Russia offered its kind of property, 10 acres of land, if they would build a temple on it. And they had 10 years to build the temple and they didn't build the temple. But money was collected for this building, supposedly. This is the report and the GBC, the guru for that temple, uh, when finally the 10 years was up and we lost the property, he apparently, you know, just skipped out and uh, left ISKCON. So again, raising the question, what happened to the money that was raised for this property? So it does seem like a lot of scams are going on where individuals within the society are running off with assets or money or buildings or whatever it might be and ISKCON is uh, being depleted down. You know, there's less and less and less every day of ISKCON because it's being converted and transferred into other charities and other assets and other properties and other uh, legal entities which are not under the control of ISKCON. And this is the problem in Brooklyn. The leaders of ISKCON are saying the Bharati Society of Brooklyn, which now is the legal entity in charge of that building, should listen to the governing body leaders and, you know, the Bharati Society is saying, why should we listen to ISKCON? We're not part of ISKCON. <laughs> which is a good argument. So it seems like ISKCON is being spun off into other charities and other legal entities and gradually, gradually, gradually ISKCON is diminishing down. So it does seem like the leaders of ISKCON formed a cabal or a kind of secret society to take over ISKCON and take over the assets of ISKCON and exploit those assets for themselves and create their own little mini kingdoms. And uh, in addition to that, there is the complaint from the founder towards the end of his life that he was being given poison. Now, I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail on this issue uh, on this particular tape, but there is evidence that he was being given heavy metals poison, like cadmium, and the GBC folks have argued that heavy metals are commonly found in medicine and other items, and this cadmium can be explained by some other means, but that's simply not the case. Cadmium is not used normally in any household products and items that people would digest and ingest. It's just not, not used. It's used in batteries, for example, but <laughs> not in items that people are eating. In any case, we do believe that there was a very sinister element within this GBC group and that Prabhupada was maliciously uh, taken out by this group so that they could take over the assets. And uh, if we look at the, their behavior after Prabhupada left, it's pretty clear that they had a lot of criminal element within this group. Anyway, to summarize some of the problems that happened right after Prabhupada left, they had a business called PDI, Prashadam Distribution International, which was being run by devotees from the Laguna Beach Temple. This was raided by the police and they uncovered some kind of heroin dealing was going on from that temple or from that building or something like that. I, I don't know the details, but the temple president was arrested. And uh, the Syracuse court, federal court, sued the entire ISKCON society in, in uh, North America for fraud because devotees were being sent out by the GBC to sell candles, to sell all kinds of trinkets, and they were collecting money for uh, you know, Mother Mary's uh, Home for the Blind, but the money wasn't going <laughs> to the Home for the Blind. <laughs> so 
So, so many scandals were going on. Anyway, that was a, a Syracuse court case, which someone could probably uh, investigate, look up, and find the details on that. But they lost the case. The Syracuse federal courts determined that ISCON was committing systematic defrauding of the public. And also, shortly after 1977, Hansa Duda's farm was raided by the uh, sheriff's department and the Berkeley police and so on. And they discovered illegal guns and illegal weapons. Hansa Duda had a machine gun in his car and all kinds of things were going on there. Later on, Hansa Duda uh, was shooting guns at occupied buildings in downtown Berkeley. And, and also, some of Kirtananda's drug mules, he was using, apparently, underage people from his community to transport drugs around the country. And a couple of young girls were caught. They had some kind of drugs in their bra or something like that. So that the idea was, if you're using underage people, they can't really be arrested for a felony because they're, they're minors. <laughs> so, anyway, this was all... Uh, unraveled as well, you know, some of their people were arrested and the whole thing, and then those girls testified that they were being sent around by the leaders. So that was going on, and uh, basically, uh, you could almost say an unlimited amount of crimes were going on. They were printing NFL stickers at New Vrindavan, and going out, making pretend they were the NFL, authorized people to sell these stickers, but the NFL didn't give them permission. Later on, they were sued by the NFL. Uh, they were making Snoopy t-shirts, and the, the artist, Mr. Sh Charles Schultz, had to sue them because he said they're, they're misrepresenting Snoopy, and also he didn't give them the permission to use Snoopy. So millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars were being collected by all kinds of illegal means. No one knows where all this went. Where has it gone to? We look at what's left of this kind. It looks like a bomb disaster. A lot of abandoned properties, sold properties, lost properties, deteriorating properties. Where did all these millions and millions and millions of dollars go? We would say the leaders took off with it. And it's in Swiss bank accounts or who knows where. But it's it's not in ISKCON, and it's not benefiting ISKCON. That is for sure. So, you know, we could go on and on and on here for another five hours about all kinds of incidents which took place, about uh, the mistreatment of individual devotees, mistreatment of buildings, uh, lost funds, stolen funds, misbehavior of gurus. Now, there's also an incident where the... ISKCON of Long Island building was mortgaged, supposedly, by the temple president who left and took the money, maybe $160,000. And the residents of the temple said, wait a minute, we can't allow this. We need to call the police and, you know, get our money back. And allegedly, Ramapad nixed that and wouldn't allow them to call the police. And he protected the uh, town president who stole all the money. And this created a lawsuit of Ramapad suing Long Island Temple. This is now in court somewhere. But uh, even the judge was a little baffled. He says, wait a minute, you're the Bharati Society. You are the Brooklyn Bharati Society, and you're trying to stop ISKCON from using the title of ISKCON, but you are yourself not ISKCON. <laughs> So, anyway, this is interesting. It shows that uh, people who siphon money off are sometimes just allowed to go away scot-free. Either that or some deal was made beforehand where that money was going to be split between different people and stuff like that. So, who knows? But the prosecution rate for all these lost buildings, lost money, lost bank accounts, gurus leaving with money, assets, this, that, and the other doesn't seem to happen. There doesn't seem to be any accountability for this, or very little, or very minimal. So, as the first 11 gurus began to fall down in various scandals and problems, they started a process of voting in more gurus, and they consulted with Sridhar Maharaj and Narayan Maharaj and other people from India who advised them 
that yes, when your so-called Jesus has a problem, you vote in more Jesuses. <laughs> that fixes things. Uh, so when you have one Bellevue patient who thinks he's Jesus and uh, he becomes exposed that he's a fraud, no problem. You just take more Bellevue patients and make them into Jesus as well. So that's basically what happened. They, they expanded the guruship to over a hundred. They voted in many, many, many more. And Ramapod was simply one of those people. So it's kind of like a franchise. You get a McDonald's franchise and you take care of this little area as long as you don't encroach on the other guy's zone or area or franchise then you're fine to go. You just, uh, you know, you cooperate with the overall group that's usurping the assets. So that's pretty much what happened. Now Jai Veda Swami says that people should write to the Attorney General of New York State to try to remedy and rectify this situation. Well, first of all, why don't we write to the Attorney General and ask him why Jai Veda says that in ISKCON their guru line contains illicit sex with men, women, and possibly children as well. What kind of guru program is advertising that their gurus are A, as good as Jesus, and B, uh, sometimes falling down into illicit sex with men, women, and possibly children also? <laughs> What kind of guru line is Jayadveda creating in the first place? So this is fraud. You can't have gurus who are engaged in illicit sex with men, women, and children. That is not legal. It's not moral. It's not legal. If, you, if you're advertising that we're promoting gurus, you can't simultaneously have uh, people who are engaged in illicit sex with men, women, and children be part of your guruhood process. Otherwise, that's fraudulent. That is not what a guru is. So we should write to the Attorney General. I think Jad Veda is right. Let's write to the Attorney General. But what we should ask is, why is the GBC promoting the worship of debauchees as God's successors? And is this not fraudulent? Is this not something we will not find in any ISKCON corporate paper anywhere? There's no corporate paper of ISKCON where it says, henceforward we shall worship illicit sex debauchees as Jesus-like Messiah saints from heaven. That is not found in any ISKCON corporate document anywhere. Thanks very much for listening and I hope this was informative.